gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again. So very grateful for just the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. We are keenly aware of our limitations, and I just ask that the Holy Spirit would strip away all that which is foolishness, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. We give you all the praise and the glory and all the honor, now and forever. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is part three of our study through John. Just to review a little bit, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we saw in our previous past several studies that Christ is God, Christ is the Word, and the Word always was. Jesus Christ is eternal. He spoke the worlds into existence, and the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 2, and that is, I believe is a reference to the Trinity. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And I believe that if we were to be very careful here and stick to the grammar or the sentence construction, it must include our being made a new creation in him, that it was made by him. Of course, not many Christians would argue that, but... Uh, I believe that, as I've pointed out in, uh, I, I think in the opening video of the series, there is a, an interesting connection between John 1 and Genesis 1, where that God said, spoke and said, let there be light. He did the same thing in our lives when we became new creations in Christ. It was God who acted first before anything that was to be created came into uh, existence. Verse 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And I don't see how we can read that without including ourselves in that, not just all of creation, all of the stars, uh, all of the, uh, the plants, the trees, the animals, and, and, uh, and, and man. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And I pointed out that uh, these are interchangeable. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life was. That's a very important uh, uh, grammatical construction. We, could, uh, we have every right to say that just as the, the text says, the life was the light of men, but we... We also have every right to say uh, that the light was the life of men. The way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The was is an imperfect tense, as I pointed out. And I believe that is introducing us, getting us, prepping us, so to speak, as we go through this uh, wonderful passage here, introducing us to the fall. Verse 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And that has deeply profound theological implications or inferences. Jesus Christ alone was righteous, the only one righteous. It, it shows that, that the righteousness of God in that verse, natural man's lack of discernment, his inability to discern anything spiritually, unless he's been first made alive, we see total depravity in that verse and the inability of man. The light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. It had no ability to comprehend the light. That's the very nature of darkness. Who alone was righteous? Jesus Christ. Now, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, but... There is no righteousness on the human level. We can't manufacture that righteousness on our own. All righteousness is of the Lord. The righteousness that we stand in is the imputed righteousness of God, where that we've been made righteous in Christ, and that through His death and resurrection. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. I believe that's where we're, we were picking up here in this uh, part three of this study. Now, many of you are aware of the, of the fact that the meaning of the name John is Jehovah has been gracious, uh, has shown favor. That's the meaning of the name. Uh, I've always found it interesting. My name, Stephen, means crown. I don't know uh, what yours means, but uh, I don't believe those are accidents. And of course, if you have a name that doesn't mean something very nice, well, I don't believe that it's it also don't believe that it's absolutely necessary that we we view ourselves as someone who isn't nice. But I do believe that when it comes to what we're looking at here, that it's God would have us take notice of the fact of what John's name, John the Baptist, John in particular, his name means. The same goes with John the Baptist as well as John the Apostle. Jehovah has been grac gracious. Jehovah has shown favor. So we're being introduced to, to John here, John the Baptist, to be, dis to be uh, distinguished from the author of the epistle. Now, it's a very interesting study for those of you who want to look deeper into the subject of, of John the Baptist and, and uh, his purpose, his mission, his witness. There's a lot that can be brought to bear on this, but let me just say that that the word man uh, there in the text is not there in the original text. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe, and the word men is not there. The text literally reads in the original text that all through him might believe. That's... That's what I'm, I'm trying to point out here. And we know from the rest of the Word of God that only His people can or will believe. Why is it you cannot hear my words? Because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, said our Lord. And the word witness, again, I believe is a reference to total depravity. Uh, the word there is through, not by or because of. I think it's interesting to take note of the, the word in the original text there, through, is the word dia, that all men through him might believe, not, not by him might believe, not because of him might believe, but through him might believe. John, interesting here, Interestingly to me here, as I was going through this, I couldn't help but take notice of the fact that John is presenting, he is proclaiming someone, a person, not, not things, not stuff, not laws, not rules, not regulations, but he's presenting a person, and we know from, uh, from Paul's teaching in the epistles that he determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. It, I want you to stop and take notice. Don't, don't let it escape your attention that, that John the Baptist is introducing a person. He's proclaiming a person. And this is what we do. We proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We present the message, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace. We present to people a person, not a list of rules and regulations on what to do. Not a formula not a method, which is basically amounts to law. In verse 8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, of course, we know from other, other references that, that some thought that John was the Messiah, as we'll see in verse 19. And we can also jump over to Luke chapter 3, and we see the same thing. Where in verse 15 of Luke 3, and as the people were in expectation, and all men um, mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. I stopped at this verse and I asked myself, why would uh, the Holy Spirit take the time to introduce us to a fact that seems so obvious on the, on the surface? 
I doubt that many Christians would read this uh, without realizing the truth that's, that is being expressed in the verse. Of course, John the Baptist was not the Messiah. We kind of take that for granted. But the Holy Spirit thought it needful to point this out. Now, I'll let you think about that for a little bit. In verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And I think I touched on this maybe in, in my last video. Uh, there, there are many ways that, that Christians uh, interpret this verse, which enlightens every man that cometh into the world. Uh, the Puritans, for one, they interpreted this. They looked at this verse as if, uh, and they kind of, they took this verse, the direction that they took this verse was one in which basically there we have this little, we're not totally depraved, but we have this little flame sort of inside us that if, it, if it's just fanned, you know, just right, you know, uh, then uh, it'll spring forth into, you know, a really hot fire for the Lord, you know, or something like that. That it can be fanned or, or extinguished. Uh, the, you know, the Arminian free will view. Now, my view is, uh, and again, like I, 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 I insist on, 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 on pointing out here as we go along that, uh, these are. This is my understanding of the text, folks, and I, I'm not asking anyone to agree with me. You need to study to see if these things be so. Don't believe something just by, because I believe it. My view may be correct or it may not be. No one has a handle on the truth, and I, I'm, I'm in. I pray constantly, folks, that the Lord would filter out all of the foolishness and seal only the truth to our hearts. But my view is that the light is that every man is condemned because of Adam's sin. Mainly because of, of how that light and life are interchangeable. The grammar allows us to, to interchange light and life. He gives light to every man who comes into the world. We know that every man is condemned because of Adam's sin, Romans chapter 5. Yet all men's transgressions in Adam were removed. That's why David could pray over his first son by Bathsheba. He cannot come to me, but I shall go to him. And in, and in no way, folks, do I expect any of you out there to believe that David anticipated hell. How did he know that that young child would be in heaven? I believe it's because the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that Adam's condemnation had been removed. In that sense, Christ draws all men unto him. In that sense, Christ lights every man that comes into the world. This is why even most Arminians believe that children go to heaven. And you ask them, you know, well, didn't they die in Adam? And you get, you know, you get back this sort of a blank stare, deer in headlights sort of a look, you know, and that doesn't count. If, if Adam's condemnation rests upon them, it either counts or it had to be removed or God uses language very foolishly, you know, very sloppily, very foolishly, foolishly. And we know who 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 put these words down it wasn't the apostle john but it was the holy spirit the lord jesus christ removed adam's condemnation condemnation for all men and that solves problems folks like like he's the savior of all men but especially those who believe and i've pointed out in my numerous videos how the redemption and salvation are two entirely different terms they're not always synonymous with one another. Depends on the context. Saved equals delivered. Saved means delivered. So in one sense, he's the, the deliverer of all men from Adam's transgression. Inclu that includes Adam. In another sense, he's the deliverer of his own people. He made them righteous. 
Uh, he didn't make everybody righteous. So I believe light is life. Life is light. We just read that, that the life was the light of men, verse 4. I think I detailed that a little bit in, in part 2. Romans 7, 7, 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And uh, I don't know how well a job I did of this, but I tried to explain that we nothing dies unless it's first alive. So we were alive in Adam. We died in Adam. We were made alive in Christ. This is how Paul could say, I was once alive apart from the law once. We know that Adam's sins Adam's transgression was removed that's that's not what you typically hear but I believe that that's what this book presents that's the that's the sequence in which the Holy Spirit lays out we were alive we had to be alive and then we died in Adam we were made alive in Christ or that Adam's transgression was removed. That's a, that's a universal atonement, folks. That's so that no man can stand before God someday and say, why are you sending me to hell? If, if a person is condemned and they, they stand before God, they have no excuse. They can't blame God for sending them to hell for something Adam did. Now, that seems to make perfect sense to me. I don't know if it does to you. But it makes perfect sense to me. But then there was a time where the law comes in, the commandment came in, and sin revived, and I died. Now I died in my own sins. And I tried to point that out in a, a previous video. And now we need to be born again. I believe we, we, uh, we need to take note of Hebrews 6 in the case of those who have once been enlightened, if you read that passage there in Hebrews 6, you'll find out that they were never really born again, but they were enlightened. Now, uh, verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. The, the word is through him. It was made through him, and the world knew him not. I believe the world is... It's the word cosmos, the ordained, organized system. He was in it, imperfect tense. He was always in it. It was created by means of him. The word know is to know through personal experience, to experientially know. Just as Mary did not know Joseph intimately. Same word, gnosko, experiential knowledge. The world as in a system, the world knew him not. In an experiential sense, it knew him not. His people would. We know that from, that from numerous scriptural accounts. Therefore, verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. That's an emphatic not. The word uh, uh, Omicron, Upsilon, the word U, absolutely not. He came unto his own, and his own absolutely did not receive him. Now, uh, if we look closer at the grammar here, his own, that's, that's a neuter, it's in the neuter. Uh, that, that could be things, uh, nation, people. It could be all those things. Israel did not receive him, and we know that that's, that's one application of the verse. And that, I think many Christians will stop there, and they limit, it, they limit the, the verse to that one application. But I, don't, I believe there's, there's, not, there's more than just one application here. The word receive, well, it's a different word from the next verse, which says they, they, do, they do receive him. Lombano is the word, to take or lay hold of. 
and here it's paralambano, the, the prefix para, it's a compound word, so the prefix para means alongside, like a parachute, you have a parachute, it's alongside you, or at least you hope it's alongside you, para, lambano. Now, that's, to me, that strongly indicates that they could not receive him on their own. If, and if, folks, if not even his own could receive him, just what does this say about modern evangelism, which suggests that goats can and, and should become sheep by, by some act of the human will? And we get, out, we get down to verse 12, but as many... Now it's changed to masculine uh, people. As many as received him or laid hold of to them, gave he power of, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And all of a sudden now we seem to have a little bit of a problem. Well, Steve, I thought we were already sons of God. If you have the authorized version, I believe it says sons of God. The word actually in the original text is children of God. But let's, let's back up here to the word authority. Uh, uh, the word is uh, exousia. That's the word authority. The first occurrence that we have of that word, I looked up, that up. That's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. For he, that is Jesus, taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Ex exousia, it's, it's compound words from ek, out, out from, ek, out from, and uh, to be, to being as a right or privilege, authority as in conferred power, but it's not the word power, it's not the word dunamis, folks, uh, that many Christians are familiar with the word dunamis as being the word power. This is not dunamis, it's exousia. Delegated empowerment, authorization. In the New Testament, exousia refers to the authority God gives to his saints, authorizing them to act in accordance with his, with his revealed word. They're, they're already, folks, they're already sons of God. Their father was never Satan. We were never we were never goats. Goats don't become sheep. And the word even is not there. To those believing into the name of him, uh, says the original text. And, and folks, I, I think I pointed this out, and I, maybe even it must have been in Ephesians. It might have been in, in, in Romans. I mentioned the fact that, that a thief doesn't have to steal to be a thief. He steals because he's a thief. The man didn't become a hireling by fleeing. He fled because he was a hireling. Say a person doesn't have to believe to be a believer. And a wall goes up. And all of a sudden, two brothers who, who are going to spend eternity together, they, they don't talk to each other anymore. You know, everything goes well until until you introduce God's sovereign power into the into the equation. They have the authority or the right to become children of God. It's not sons, we us. Okay. It's it's uh, techna. Technos. They it's not sons. They, they're already sons. We have the right to call ourselves a child technos or techna of God to those that believe on his name. They believe because they are a child. They don't become a child by believing, which would be an exercise of free will. As the following verse declares and confirms. Folks, you murder because you're a murderer. You steal because you're a thief. And you believe because you're a believer. It's a term that God uses uh, in regard to one of his own. 
which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And wow, now we got a huge, huge problem uh, going about saying this when we go around quoting this uh, to 90% of Christianity out there. Modern Christianity, folks, does not take this verse at face value taken at face value, we don't have a problem, but disregarding these words will, will result in a theology that, that can be nothing but inconsistent, taking us down the wrong, uh, an, an entirely wrong path. The word born, let's look at that, those who received him were born. They weren't born because they received. That ought to be absolutely clear. Okay, so we know that. Now, how were they born? Not of blood, not of their race or physical birth, not of man, not of man. You know, the word uh, andros there, it, the word means male. It's not of the male. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Hang with me here. The word is not anthropos, man, where we get our word anthropology, man, mankind. The word is male, okay, andros, not by natural birth. Total depravity assures us of that. What they, what they say to Jesus? Abraham is our father, they said, Matthew 3. And Jesus had to correct them on that natural, fleshly, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the male, but out of God were born. Why? Because of what we've previously read uh, all through the passage about darkness, sin, total depravity. We know that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Therefore, light precedes belief. New birth precedes belief. In the beginning, God created original creation. And God said, let there be light. And God shined light into our hearts and made us a new creation in Christ. New birth, folks, made you willing. Okay? In verse 17, we'll see, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. If we go back to Amos, all the way back to Amos chapter 5, verse 18, we'll, we, we read, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Well, there's a lot of Christians around here desiring the day of the Lord. All these watchmen on the wall, all these people looking up, uh, including myself. Come, Lord Jesus. I mean, I'm ready. I know most of, most of, of you out there are. What am I reading here? Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you the day of the Lord is darkness and not light? Darkness and not light. The light exposes the darkness, folks. Okay? We know the flesh profits nothing. If we go over to Matthew chapter 3, we read, uh, But when he, he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that God's able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, Therefore, every tree which brings, bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. 
Folks, we have no righteousness, righteousness in and of ourselves. The, the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit. The flesh profits nothing. God first had, had to first say, let there be light. We had to be made a new creation in Christ before we could do anything. Anything that you did, folks, receive, accept, believe, repent, that, any of that, all of that, every bit of that was a result of your new birth, not, a cause, not the cause for it. It followed. New birth preceded all of that. All of that stemmed forth from the new man, not the flesh, because the flesh profits nothing. And why is John the Baptist announcing the coming of, the presence of, Jesus Christ? You know, it, it, it certainly wasn't, well, hey, hey, folks, look, listen, look, here's the, here's the Moses that you've been waiting for. John didn't introduce Moses, who, who, by the way, wrote about Christ in the law as did the prophets. Folks, our concern ought to be, as Christians, fruit-bearing, the, the walking uprightly. Bema, we, have, we are facing Bema. Folks, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but we are, we are facing, we are rushing headlong toward the judgment seat of Christ, where the, our works will be judged. Our entire life's work, singular, read it in the Greek, singular, will be judged. We're not going to see some rotten movie of every rotten thing that we've ever done. Our entire lives will be judged on the basis of, of, of what came forth out of the new man as opposed to the old man. The new man, folks, gold, silver, precious stones, not the old man, hay, wood, and stubble. Okay? Now I'm looking ahead here to verse 15, I know. Jesus sur surpassed John the Baptist. Why? Because Jesus was before him. Folks, where is your emphasis? Is it on Christ or is it on self? That's my, that's my question to all of you. All of you. Any of you. Is Where is your interest? Where is your primary focus? What is your primary message? Is it Christ or is it directed towards self? Who are you presenting? The Christian as to, you know, how that he can be the best Christian that he can be. Kind of like the army thing, you know, be all you can be. Or is your message, your ministry, your, your focus on Jesus Christ? This has deeply profound theological implications, folks, not just physical. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John's not introducing some Moses done been there done that been there done that okay all right let me let, let, let me see if I got this straight you, you folks want to live according to the law flesh okay which was given 3360 some odd years ago that Israel couldn't keep while rejecting the grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ whom John the Baptist introduced who was and is the fulfillment of the law? Are you kidding me? Romans 7, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter. That is law. As we go down through the, these verses, folks, 
just in what we've seen so far. It's, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit really packs a punch in the first few verses before we even get to verse 14. We see God, Jesus is God, a very God, eternal, who spoke the worlds into existence, cre creator, God, light, life. We see total depravity, just the opposite in us, total depravity. That, that Jesus Christ is being presented, not, not law, not some other prophet, not some other messenger, but Christ himself who was witnessed we, we actually see election, universal atonement, our, our, our transgressions removed in Adam, we, but we also see substitutional, you know, he, that he died in our place. And we see a religious system. We're getting a glimpse of a, of a religious system, a world system composed of both Jew and Gentile. Don't just look at this as Israel. This Steve, this stuff here that's going on here, this all has to do with Israel. didn't have anything to do with us. I beg to differ. <coughs> now before I close here, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to think about something. There, there's some criticism out there of John 1.13. Of course, there's a lot of people that will interpret this in different ways. People, the flesh, folks, the natural mind, the flesh, the human mind, the human way of thinking, the, uh, I don't know, wh whatever else that you could throw into that garbage bin, will try anything and everything to get away from the words of this verse. John 1, 13. Born again by the will of God. Well, Steve, it's surely, surely, surely it doesn't say that. Yes, it does. And so... They, it doesn't fit into their narrative, kind of like something else I've been thinking of lately with the, with the news. I could, if I could use that expression. It doesn't fit their theology. It doesn't fit their narrative. So they've got to have to come up with some reason. And they have gone to great lengths, folks. I mean to tell you, they have. I, I want to take you back here to the begin to, uh, well, let's go back. Let's look at, I've got to magnify this to, to even see it on my screen. The word and in the Greek is the word chi, okay? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, okay? That's one complete thought connected by these conjunctions. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God, stop. End of thought. Starts a new thought. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Stop. We, we, we go on and we read, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's one thought. Verse 11, starting at verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not, but continuing the same thought, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what they're going to tell you, what many will tell you, is, well, this verse 13, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, nor, nor of the will of man, but of God, that is speaking of Jesus Christ, not you. That's how they get out of it. Pretty easy, huh? Pretty simple, huh? Doesn't, it's not talking about you at all. It's talking about Christ. I want to give you my opinion on this. You take it for whatever it's worth. 
Again, I don't ask anybody to agree with me. So we see from 11 to 14, we have an intimate grammatical connection here, I believe, between us and the Lord. Uh, I believe it's talking, folks, about the both of us, Christ and us, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, both us and Christ. Kinsman, Redeemer, not ashamed to call us brethren, identified with Him, His body. Folks, bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, complete in Him. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. I think I read Romans 7, 4 previously here. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. If ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, singular, singular, folks, one seed. Folks, listen to me. I, I, I wrangled over these verses till 4 a.m. this morning, and uh, I was so excited over what I was seeing that I could, I could barely go to sleep. We are so intimately connected to Jesus Christ and that ought to make your heart rejoice. What's revealed in, in verses 12 and 13, I believe, is kinship. It isn't just talking about us being born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. It's not just about us. I'm seeing more than us in that passage. I'm seeing the incarnation and our new birth being so intri intricately, so intimately connected as, as I'm just, I'm beyond words. Now that's what I'm seeing in the text. He doesn't call me servant or sinner. He calls me brother. He called me righteous. There wouldn't be any birth for me, folks, in this text if there hadn't been for his incarnation in this text, if he, if he had not become my kinsman redeemer and, and died in my place, I'm so intimately connected with him that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to, us to see in verse 13, 12 and 13, that we are so intimately connected with him, identified with him. If, if he had not died in my place, folks, if he had not become my kinsman, redeemer, become incarnate in human flesh, if he had not identified with, with me in his death, burial, and resurrection, then, folks, these verses mean nothing. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope that some of you have been helped by this video. I appreciate all of your continued prayers all of the messages that I've received, uh, please comment, like, share, uh, do so as you feel led. I pray for you all constantly, and I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.